Yo, what's up everybody? It is Monday, March 4th. Yeah. How the guns? How the guns looking? I did a little sparring and boxing over the weekend for the first time. And man, it was rough. I got a, I got a long way to go. I'll tell you that. All right. Here's what I want to talk about today. Oh, I don't understand why everything has to be a calamity. I mean, everything is always framed as this, you know, this doomsday. If stocks go up, oh my God, it's a bubble, it's a bubble. If stocks go down, oh, it's a crash, we're going to have a depression. The dollar's gonna go down, the dollar is gonna crash because uh, people uh, don't wanna hold dollars anymore. Inflation, oh my God, it's terrible. Prices are going up. Interest rates are up, oh my God, it's terrible. Everything is terrible. Why is everything always framed as a calamity? I just, I don't get it. I mean, you gotta learn how to go with the flow, man. You know, you just, like I always tell you guys, information, knowledge, understanding, that's the best way to protect yourself. That's the best way, not just to protect yourself, but to benefit when things change. Things are always changing, but everybody right away, it's a calamity, it's the end of the world. I mean, sharp people are saying, okay, I understand that change is inevitable. I'm going to adapt. What's the definition of intelligence? It's the ability to adapt. But no, like most of you, you sit around, ah, oh, it's a calamity. It's the end of the world. It's doomsday. It's in terrible. It's terrible. Interest rates went up. When I bought my first house, my mortgage was 11 and three quarter percent. 11 and three quarter percent. I bought a house. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? There was a period in the, in the 1980s, for those of you who are old enough, where we had the farm crisis. They actually had be like, like benefits to help farmers, like concerts, farm aid, because prices were so low that farms were going bankrupt left and right. That's our food production. So people say, oh, inflation is terrible. Yeah, but that... That feeds the producers, that feeds the farmers. You know, there's two sides to everything, man. There's two sides to everything. Like people are so into their micro view of, you know, micro personalized view of everything that it's impossible for them to get out of that, that view. And then they just become paralyzed. And so no matter what happens, it's a calamity. It's the end of the world, you know. And all they can do is scream about it and bitch about it. And when they have the opportunity, even when they have the opportunity to help themselves, they're like, no, that's too much work. Remember, I talked about uh, mental weakness. It's too much work. I don't want to learn that stuff. You know, it, it's confusing. The first, the first glance, it's confusing. To everybody, it's confusing. I just, I've been doing this boxing now for six months. I got beat up pretty good on this. And I thought, I, I thought, and I did progress from the, you know, from the first couple of days that I was doing it. But I mean, I, I realized that I have a long way to go. Am I saying, you know, no mas, no mas. I'm not doing it anymore. No, I'm not. I mean, uh, I'm committed. It takes commitment. Anyway, let's go over some of the stuff that's going on. First of all, woo! February ended big with the flows, and March, March 1st, which was on Friday, I just got the data. So February ended up with a $305 billion deficit. That's a huge transfer. $305 billion net transfer to the economy just in February, all right? March 1st, we had a 129 billion leading flow 
And I think, I don't have the number now, but I think that the net flow was almost 90 billion. We are now up, leading flow, spending flows are now up 121 billion over last year. Remember last year we did 7 trillion. We're up 121 billion. So like what I was saying is that February is the peak, the annual peak in these, in these, in the flow cycle. It doesn't mean it collapses. It just means like, and why does it happen in February? It happens in February because that's the biggest month of tax refunds. All right. So in February, you, you get a, a quarterly interest payment and those keep going up because the Fed is keeping interest rates, you know, elevated. Uh, then you get the tax refunds. So it's just like everything comes together like a tsunami in February. And then Friday was March 1st, where you had the first of the month payments. So big, big, big flows, like massive flows. He's tidal wave. Um, and by the way, th that could be the reason February we saw record high in Bitcoin. All right. We saw gold rallying, silver. Uh, but those instruments are going to be subject to the same, you know, tax drain effect that we're going to see a little bit later this month and definitely in April. All right. Stocks for sure benefited from these massive flows. Now, now that I got that out of the way, what I wanted to talk about, I, I did a video a few weeks ago where I said, uh, you know, if the world de-dollarizes, it's not going to be a big deal for the United States economy, okay? And somebody posted a comment and also sent me an email. It was the same, the email he sent was the comment saying that I have a, I'm, I'm totally wrong on this. It's going to be terrible for the U.S. because the U.S. is not going to be able to get cheap goods from China. And, you know, if nobody accepts the dollar, it's going to be a disaster for the United States. And, okay, those are the points that were made, but I, I, I think they are misinformed. Okay? And I'll, I'll explain why. First of all, um, the only thing that really changes if, let's say, the United States, the U.S. dollar is no longer the reserve currency or foreigner... Let, let's, let me state it a different way. If foreigners give back their dollars to the U.S., so to speak, exchange their dollars for goods, services, assets in the U.S., all that happens really is the composition of the U.S. economy changes. We go from um, a consumption-based economy to a production-based economy, all right? And you got to remember that this would not be the first time that something like this happened. And before I even get into that, let's understand that the, the Chinese currency, the yuan, is not uh, a currency used in exchange, global exchange. Yet China has built, at least by purchasing power parity, comparison has built the largest economy. It has surpassed the size of the United States economy. Again, when you look at it in terms of purchasing power parity, and I, I think that's the proper way to look at it. Okay. Uh, and, and Yuan is, is not uh, a global unit of transaction. I mean, it's not accepted. It's, it's kept, maybe now it's starting to happen a little bit, and, but China is even standing in the way of that. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's impeding that conversion to a transactional currency. It doesn't really, you know, it probably, no Chinese officials probably know it's inevitable. But right now, they, you know, they, they're holding it back. So China built the world's largest economy, again, by per PPP uh, comparison, without uh, an exchangeable currency, Okay. The United States in <clears throat> most of the first half of the 20th century, um, 
the U.S. dollar was not the reserve currency, and the United States uh, was a major net exporter. It built a, a, a powerhouse industrial economy uh, under those conditions. Okay, the, the, the British, the pound sterling was the global reserve currency up until right after World War II, all right? Um, and that's a good example too. What happened to Britain? I mean, yes, uh, the sterling lost its role as the global currency. Uh, you know, I would say go to, go to England, go to the UK, and tell me if you think, go to London, tell me if you think that's an impoverished country. I mean, that, that's certainly a first world country. It's a modern country. It's an affluent country. Yeah, it doesn't have the currency um, sterling as the global currency that it did, you know, prior to World War II. Uh, it may not be an empire anymore. It's not an empire anymore, but there's no way you can argue that the UK is some kind of uh, third world country. It's not, all right? Same thing with Japan. Uh, if you look at the breakdown of foreign exchange transaction, where a little more than half of all global transaction, I think, is in US dollars, and then it breaks down uh, after that. The yen is... I don't know, I think it's something like 10%. I might be wrong on that figure, but it's not, it's not big. And again, I would challenge anybody to go to Japan and tell me that that's a third world country. It's not. It's an ultra modern advanced economy. Doesn't have a global reserve currency. It's an ultra modern advanced economy. So, I led into this, this video with this comment about calamity, like everybody thinks automatically, and I don't know why, it's some kind of psychological thing. Maybe, maybe you could tell me why, I'm not a psychologist, but why is it that everything is always framed in this freaking doomsday scenario? And we're talking about financial stuff, economic stuff. We're not talking about world war or nuclear war. Oh, that, that's something I would say, yeah. You know, it's calamitous. You know, we, we, that's something to freak out about. I mean, de-dollarization, and by the way, I, I don't see any evidence of that. If you look, and I did a video where I, gave, I, I actually included the link from the U.S. Treasury Department where you could see uh, all the um, the foreign holders of U.S. debt, and U.S. debt is basically dollars just held in the form of a government security, and it's just been going up. I mean, some countries have reduced, like China reduced a little bit, Japan reduced, but other countries stepped up and they're holding more dollars. The trend is is going up, so I don't see any evidence of it. But even if there were, I mean, big deal, big deal. Don't get your panties all in a knot. It changes the, con I mean, we see what we're seeing right now, by the way, is, you know, foreign entities investing in the United States in uh, capital uh, production, you know, plants, uh, and production facilities, all right? Farmland, the Chinese are buying farmland. Stuff like that, man. Um, and, you know, we are the law, the United States is also, I think, I think the commenter, maybe and I could be wrong, but it said something like, we have nothing to sell. Or, we're the largest oil producer in the world. The United States is the largest oil producer in the world. That's not going away anytime soon. All I'm saying here is before you get into this calamity mode 
where everything is a disaster, everything, right? Like I said, stocks could go up, people are gonna say it's a disaster. Stocks go down, people are gonna say it's a disaster. The dollar fluctuates, that's a disaster. Prices go up, that's a disaster. Interest rates go up, that's a disaster. I'm telling you, if interest rates go down, that's a disaster. If prices come down, they're gonna be screaming about deflation. No matter what it is, all you guys are gonna be screaming about something. I mean, take control of your freaking emotions, man. Really, I, it's like you're a bunch of hysterical little girls who have no control over your emotion. Mike, you said this thing was gonna go down on that day and it didn't go down on that day. Ah, you're a criminal. A guy called me a criminal. Take control of your emotions. Man, <laughs> I assume that most of you who watch this channel are adults. If you're adults, act like adults. Don't frame everything in this calamitous outcome. Try to understand before, you know, you make comments. It's not going to be a big deal. I'll tell you what will get affected, all right, if you want to know, because maybe you say, oh, he thinks everything is just, no matter what happens, everything is just going to be wonderful. Well, I'll tell you what will. The United States won't have the ability to weaponize its financial system against the rest of the world. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing. But that's a separate argument, okay? The only thing that happens is the composition of the economy change. What does that mean? It just, it looks different. It'll look different than how it looks right now. And that doesn't mean it'll go from how it looks right now to like a third world dystopian nightmare. No, it'll be more production, less consumption. And who knows, you'd have to even make the argument of less consumption. We're only using, what is it, 74, 75%. If you look at uh, uh, capacity utilization, right? That number comes out every month with industrial production and capacity utilization. Capacity utilization is how much of our output ability, out, our, our capacity, our productive capacity, how, what percentage of that are we using? 74, 75, 76%. We're not maxed out by any means. I mean, if you go back to the 1950s and the 1960s, I think we were up around 90%. So this whole outsourcing thing, you know, we've gone to these countries, we, we, we've set up our productive capacity in China, in, in Mexico, in Vietnam, in these places. But we have, we're only using three quarters of our capacity here. You could, you could look that number up, capacity utilization. So to argue that we're not going to be able to make the stuff to, that we need to consume, you got to show me why that's going to be true. Because I'm going to tell you, we're only using three quarters of our capacity. We have a whole 25% just sitting there idle that we could use. So before you tell me that we're not gonna be able to make the stuff that we need, you're gonna have to explain to me why. And there could be, there could be very valid explanations. You could say, well, we haven't, re that capacity that we don't use, that spare capacity that we don't use, that's outdated, that's obsolete. And I would listen to that. I would listen to that. But you can't just say, no, necessarily, de facto, we're not gonna be able to do it. No, you have to explain to me why we're not gonna be able to do it, okay? You have to back up your argument and explain. I'll listen, I will listen. And if you're right, you're right. And, and maybe, the, you know, I just kind of gave you the answer. Maybe that stuff is, obsolete. 
Maybe we haven't invested enough. I know we our, our infrastructure is crumbling. I, when I travel around and I go, you go to airports like in foreign countries and you say, wow, this is way better than what we have. That's a good argument. I would listen to something like that. But you can't just say that automatically, necessarily, we're not going to be able to produce. This is, this is a massive, massive economy, okay? It's still bigger than China's when you just do, you know, uh, you don't do the purchasing power parity comparison, all right? So, folks, calm down a little bit, okay? Everything is not the end of the world all the time. Take control of your emotions, all right? I, I don't know, like, people have gotten, and, and this is a relatively new, I think this is a relatively new phenomenon. I, I just think maybe it's my age, but it seems to me that, you know, kind of like back in the old days, so to speak, people were tougher. They were more resilient. They were able to roll with the punches. Now everything is like the end of the world. It's terrible no matter what happens, good or bad, they'll find a way to frame it as a calamity. You gotta stop with this stuff, folks. You really have to stop with this stuff. Anyway, don't forget, go to my website, pitbulleconomics.com and sign up for a 30-day free trial of MMT Trade. Uh, I am the only one who has an applied approach to MMT. I take the concepts and understandings of MMT and I apply them to investing and trading in the financial market. See you tomorrow. Bye.